Moving on now into the Mosaic Covenant, we're going to see a, a bit of an expansion, a bit of a deeper type of covenant than we've seen so far. The Mosaic Covenant is somewhat unique among all of the covenants that God made with his people in the Old Testament. We see the Mosaic Covenant actually develop in three distinct parts. And then once developed and beginning to be executed, it's also continued through Moses' successor, who is Joshua, uh, during his entry and during the entry of the Israelites into the land of Canaan as they begin to take possession of the land that was once promised to Abraham under the Abrahamic covenant. So as we look at the Mosaic covenant, we recognize that there is a pre-Exodus element to this covenant, that is the portion that is made before the Israelites or the children of Israel depart from Egypt, we find that there is a part that is made post-Exodus, that is in the time after they leave Egypt, but before the law is given and the tabernacle is raised up. And then we finally have the post Sinai or the post synatic period, and that is when the law has been given and the temple uh, begins to be erected, the tabernacle, if you will, in the wilderness, the mobile tabernacle, uh, which is the precursor first to the temple in Israel, which uh, is also known as Solomon's temple, and eventually the precursor to the living temple of today, which is where the Holy Spirit dwells, which is the physical body and spiritual body of every single believer. So there are a lot of tie-ins. There are a lot of links now between the Mosaic Covenant and the body of Christ. And we'll see that as we look through and examine this, uh, this covenant uh, briefly, but in its totality with a little overview here in the next few minutes. Now, when we look at this, we realize that it was through Moses' obedience that he became the man of God through which the Lord worked to effect the release of the Hebrews from Egyptian bondage. It was Moses' faith that led to his obedience. It was a trusting faith that he had. And in this, he becomes a type of Christ who is an intercessor uh, to, uh, through the Lord to Pharaoh. He pleads on their behalf. He works miracles as Jesus worked miracles and eventually effects their release and becomes a type of Christ who leads them out of bondage and towards their salvation, towards their promised end. So in that, in that first phase, he becomes that type of Christ. Now during this pre-Exodus period, which is recorded in Scripture, in Exodus chapter 3, verse 1 through uh, Exodus 12, verse 51, the Lord called Moses to be his servant and deliverer of his people. And again, uh, we recognize uh, that there's, there are many parallels between what Moses did and what Jesus did, as we just mentioned. Now, just as Moses had Aaron as his high priest and as his spokesperson, Jesus also had 
disciples to go out and to speak on his behalf as well. And later on, we discover as we read through Exodus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, Leviticus, as we read through all of the all of the uh, Torah books, the books of the law, we realize that there are many things that Moses eventually passed off or shared with other leaders. So we realize that there are a lot of parallels between what Moses did and what Jesus did as far as responsibility and obeying God and sharing the word to obey God. What we want to see, though, is that as we're looking at the work that Moses did, and we see all of these miracles that he performed, all of these mighty miracles that could have only been done by the hand of God, that as Jesus himself would later say, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And ultimately, it was not a sign that freed the Hebrews, but it was the mighty hand of God bringing death among unbelievers in the form of the death of their firstborn. So we see here an extreme contrast of the believer who placed the lamb's blood on the doorposts and lentils of their entrances to their homes, believing God, trusting him by faith, and acting in obedience according to that faith, the same way we call upon Christ today, trusting in his promise, believing and calling upon him for salvation, as opposed to those who rejected the warning, they rejected the call, they were told what was going to happen, and they did nothing about it, and their firstborn died. This is what is, again, another type of, actually, this is a type of salvation, and this is a type of contrast between salvation and condemnation that Jesus talks about. We live in a state of condemnation unless we call upon the Lord and unless we trust him at his word and act upon it by calling upon him to forgive us our sins, repenting and choosing a life for him, that his Holy Spirit may come and dwell with us and seal us until the day of redemption. Now, again, we see the Lord's mighty hand at work during this post-Exodus period, after the children of Israel have left, after they have been freed or released from Egypt. Pharaoh is like a jealous lover. He feels himself in this love triangle, and he is at that point now where he is totally embarrassed, he's totally enraged, he's totally incensed, and the Bible even tells us the Lord hardened his heart again once the Egyptians fled. We don't know what tool the Lord used, but we do know that his heart was hardened again, and he took off after the Israelites. And of course, we know the story at the Red Sea where he had them cornered and thought that he had everything, thought he had the whole problem solved, and he was either going to bring them back to Egypt or he was going to slay them out there. He basically had that mentality, either I'm going to have them or nobody's going to have them. No God is going to take them away from me. They are mine. They belong to me. They're my property. Folks, when we look at this story, we clearly see Pharaoh in Egypt as a type of Satan who desires to sift each and every one of us as wheat. If he can't have us, he wants nobody to have us. He will do everything to destroy us. That's why his name is given to us as a Baden and a Polyon in the book of Revelation, the word literally means destroyer. It literally means destroyer. When Jesus says that in John chapter 10, that none shall perish, 
the root for that word that Jesus talks about is that none shall be destroyed. That Apollyon word has the same root for destroy as perish. So Jesus is promising us that we will never face destruction. We will never face annihilation. We will never face condemnation. We will never face um, judgment in that sense where we will be condemned and damned for all times. So what happens is his pride becomes his ultimate downfall. His pride destroys his own leadership his pride destroys his personal kingdom, and it cripples his nation for some time to come. And yet through all of this, God does not utterly destroy Egypt. Egypt is still a nation to this day. And every Egyptian still to this day has the opportunity to repent before Almighty God and receive Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior. This is how long-suffering our Lord is. Now, in the last instance, God manifests himself to his people in totality, in general, and to Moses in particular as his man in numerous ways. But when the tabernacle is constructed, he then has a dwelling place that he has designated where he comes down, where he appears in his Shekinah glory, before Moses, and the people know when he's there. I could go into a lot of detail about what happens and what takes place and so forth. I would recommend that you read it yourself. It's, it's, it's a very, very wonderful and, and very opening and, and enlightening uh, account of these interactions between Moses and God in the temple uh, as close to any man has come to seeing God face to face and and living, other than the instance with Jacob wrestling with the angel of God. And Moses did this on a regular basis for much of his life. But they had the Ten Commandments, and the Ten Commandments were not for salvation. The Ten Commandments were for direction. It was the faith in the God who gave the law. It was the faith and the trust that this, that this God, this was their God, and that his promises were true. And by obeying him and by following him and by trusting him, that his blessings that he promised would be received, that was their salvation. Their salvation was obedience through trust and faith, and that's how they were counted righteous. And it works the same way today. Our salvation in Christ Jesus comes by our trust and our faith and our belief that his promise for eternal salvation is true. Back then, they had a law that they were supposed to follow. Today, we should still be behaving very much like the Hebrews, except for the ordinances. We don't have to kill goats. We don't have to kill bullocks. We don't have to kill turtle doves. We don't have to make all kinds of different offerings and so forth. Uh, we don't have to have various feasts and so forth and so on. But we are still supposed to behave in much the same manner. We're not supposed to murder people. We're not supposed to lie, cheel, steal, cheat. We're supposed to honor God above all else. We're supposed to honor father and mother. We're not supposed to commit adultery. We're not supposed to bear false witness against our neighbor. I mean, I'm just kind of hopping around the Ten Commandments here, but this, this should be our behavior in everyday life as we seek to please the Lord. If we're doing the things that Jesus has taught us to do, we're going to be doing these things and we're doing them out of love and we're obeying the Lord because we trust him, we believe him, and we love him. But the first and foremost thing we have to obey is that call to salvation because trusting Jesus to be our one and only advocate, our one and only 
doorway, our one and only way, the one and only truth, the one and only eternal life giver. That is the key. Now we'll take just a moment here to look at this promise to Joshua. The promise given to Moses was then passed on to Joshua. And in Joshua chapter 1, we read that the Lord tells him that I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. He repeats the same promise that he gave to Moses. He tells him in in verses 7 through 9 of chapter 1 to continue to obey the law. And again, this is what This is what the good Hebrew was to do then, and our behavior as Christians should still reflect this today, even though we're not bound by a law, our behavior is still, the Apostle Paul speaks of it in many places, about our behavior should be that which becometh saints. Uh, He uses the term conversation, and that basically means uh, how we behave ourselves in everyday life. One of the things he also points out is that leadership is of paramount importance and leaders are responsible for their followers even if they don't know every little aspect of what their followers are doing. When Achan in chapter 7 took what, what is called the accursed thing and hid it, Eventually, Achan and his, entire, and his entire family suffered for it, but at first, the entire nation of Israel was suffering at the Battle of Ai, and they were losing the battle. They lost their first battle there. And Joshua prayed to the Lord and wanted to know why, and God said, because the accursed thing is among you. Achan has taken the accursed thing. Well, Joshua knew nothing about it, but he's the leader of his people, and he's responsible. It shows how important leadership is to God. And if we are teaching, preaching, evangelizing, if we are even representing the Lord in any manner simply by being His, that responsibility is very, very powerful. And we have to be careful what we say and what we do because the Lord tells us that every that we are accountable for every idle word that we speak. Now, the final thing that I'd like to share with you and I'd like to point out is that as each one of these battles continues, as as Joshua and the children of Israel continue to take more and more of the land in Canaan that was promised to them through Abraham, Back in the Abraham covenant, Abrahamic covenant, God steps back more and more and provides less and less miraculous or supernatural intervention until finally Joshua is just a general of a very powerful and very skilled army taking the land that is promised to them away from people to whom it does not belong. God does the same thing to us as believers today. So these people now are acting as types of believers in Christ. In that, we are to learn and to grow and to mature. And as we do so, God backs up and lets up on the reins more and more and sends us out and gives us more responsibility and more things to do as we grow and we mature in our faith and in our knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there are so many parallels, and I've only just touched on a few in this 20 minutes or so of this message, but there are so many parallels in the Mosaic Covenant. It is just so, so rich. But we see here the Lord's reconciliatory will just completely at work. Because if you look at the background of how the Hebrews fell into Egypt, if you look at the story of Joseph and his brothers and how Joseph ended up in Egypt in the first place, and you look at the story of the the account of the famine, 
and how all of the children of Israel ended up in Egypt, and you look at how the Hebrews fell out of favor with the leadership of Egypt and became slaves, and the 400 plus years of their slavery before God finally raised up a man as their deliverer. There are so many parallels. That 400 years is another parallel because the intertestamental period between the Old Testament and the New Testament is roughly 400 years where God goes silent and then his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, comes on the scene and God begins interacting and speaking with mankind again. There are just so many types and parallels here. It's just not enough time to cover it in one brief little message. But consider this. God is always consistent. He's always faithful. He's asking for you to trust him. He's asking for you to obey him. And he's asking for you to love him. So until next time, stay in his word and stay true to his word. In Christ's undying love, amen.